Welcome to Face to Face, connecting theater makers to the public, a program from the Legacy Theater and SocialDistanceTheater.org. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Face to Face. I'm Tess Adams, and I'm so excited to welcome today's artist. She and I met back in 2006 when we both made our Broadway debuts in the revival of Les Miserables. And she is a beautiful singer and actress who has since gone on to star as Christine Daae in The Phantom of the Opera and as Maria in the most recent US national tour of West Side Story. You may also have seen her in the 2015 Broadway revival of The King and I, or in the world's record holder for longest running musical, The Fantastics, or in concert halls around the world. It is my pleasure to welcome Ali Ewald. Hi, Ali. Hi, Tess. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good, thank you. Lovely to see your face. It's so lovely to see yours. Um, what have you been up to during quarantine? Oh, goodness. That is a very good question. Um, I am currently at my parents' house. They live up in Pleasantville, New York. Um, I was in the city sort of when everything started happening and I thought that my small studio apartment maybe was not the best place for my dog and I to hang out for an extended period of time. And so my parents were very kind to take us in. And so we've been able to at least get some outdoor time. My mom's cooking is amazing. Um, and I'm definitely spending more time in my childhood bedroom than I have since I graduated from high school. So that's been a real adventure. Um, but I've been trying to you know, keep myself busy, um, exercising, doing a lot of yoga, trying to learn how to cook a little better, um, reading Netflix, um, and then making some fun projects. It's great to talk to you because I actually, um, one of my favorite projects that I've done was a, a neighborhood sing-along of Les Mis. <laughs> I um, switched some of the lyrics up and a whole bunch of my neighbors, like 11 households um, around our block joined in and we blasted the music from the car and they marched and sang. Um, and it was actually a really amazing, uplifting, Thing. I think, you know, you and I know how special Les Mis is, and sometimes I forget that it means so much to the rest of the world as well, since I have such a personal connection with it. Um, but it was really wonderful to revisit that music and that time and to really bring everyone together that way. That's amazing. The next question I was going to ask you was what you've been doing to fulfill yourself creatively during this time. So there's that project. And um, have you been doing anything else or have you been taking a little break and like time for yourself? It's sort of a combination. I definitely kind of gauge how I'm feeling from day to day. If I want to, you know, sit on the couch in my pajamas all day, I think that's completely acceptable during this time. Um, I've been fortunate. A lot of people have reached out to ask me to be parts of different projects that they're working on. And that's really fun to collaborate, even though we can't be face to face. Um, I actually am working on a project and we had a whole email dialogue back and forth and it's a brand new song. And it's so interesting given this time that, you know, I can record something and then they can send me notes and then I can record again. And we have to have a dialogue in a different way. I desperately wish we could just be in a rehearsal room together, but I think we're all kind of trying to figure out how to continue to be creative and support each other um, when we can't be in person. So that's been a, a very interesting journey. Um, but I'm also doing some, you know, silly passion projects that are just fun and hopefully bring some joy into the world and at the very least keep me creatively occupied so I don't completely lose my mind and or drive my parents crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I wanted to kind of start from your early career because one thing that I think is really cool about you is that you didn't train in a conservatory program. You actually studied psychology at Yale. Did you know before attending college that you wanted to pursue a career in the arts? Yes and no. I, um, I fell in love with musical theater uh, at a very young age, having grown up really close to the city. I was fortunate. I had um, two aunts who lived in Queens and we would go and visit them. And the eldest one loved musicals. 
And so she took me to my first Broadway show, probably my second, third, and fourth as well. And we would borrow her VHSs of all the old movie musicals. Um, and then I um, went to a great public high school here in Pleasantville. I had an amazing teacher who happened to really value the art form of musical theater and sort of infused the entire town with that same passion. And so, you know, for a tiny public high school, we had maybe 400 kids total and probably over a hundred in the musicals on stage. And then not to mention the crew, all the backstage crews and costumes and hair and makeup and all of that fun stuff. Um, I even got to star opposite the quarterback of the football team in Kids Me Kate when I was a junior. So it was a really amazing experience for so many people to actually really value musical theater. And obviously I was super in love with it. I had been taking dance class from a young age and voice lessons. I played the oboe, was in the chorus and all that stuff. Um, but somehow I knew that um, being a performer full time was very challenging. I'd actually done one professional show when I was 10 at a local dinner theater. It was the um, Maury Yeston Arthur Copet version of Phantom. Um, it was the New York premiere of that. And I was in it probably for about seven months. And I had a very, very minor role. I was, you know, filling out the ensemble as a child. Um, but I think maybe being around those performers and kind of sitting back and observing their lifestyle and understanding that it was a very um, competitive business, I thought that um, it would behoove me to continue to study academics and be able to perform simultaneously and hopefully to find something else that I was similarly passionate about. Obviously that didn't happen. <laughs> so in some ways I think college was kind of my denial phase. But what was great about going to a liberal arts school was that I met all of these amazing people, my roommates who are still very, very close friends of mine who were passionate about lots of other things. Um, I think that gave me a really great perspective about the world and my place in it. And, um, you know, really interesting information as an actor to get to know people that are passionate about other things. Um, and for me, psychology was the major that I most related to, I think because it is the most relatable to acting in understanding why people do what they do. And also it honestly had fewer course requirements necessary to graduate. So I was able to perform extracurricularly all the time. In the summers I'd go do summer stock, take voice lessons, all that stuff. Um, so when I graduated, I decided that I would give it, give it a go, um, that, you know, I really sort of owed it to myself to at least try to do this thing that I was very passionate about and thankfully have been very fortunate since. I'm curious, do you, I certainly find this, do you find that having a community of friends that are not in the business is really important? I love it. I think it's really wonderful. I have a lot of wonderful friends in the business and I love having friends that do other things too. I think it's very easy for us as artists to get very wrapped up in what we're doing and to put a lot of pressure on ourselves to keep achieving things, you know, to book the next, next job is so important and critical. And, um, and I love seeing people doing other things and really inspiring other things. Um, and the reminder that that gives me that um, that this one job isn't going to make or break my entire life, that there is some perspective out there and there are other, there are other opportunities and other options and other paths. And, um, I mean, I say this a lot, but it's interesting as actors, we very rarely play actors. We usually play humans who have other jobs and other interests. And I love that I know those people and I can draw upon that, you know, when I'm, when I'm performing. You've said that your psychology degree has been very connected with the work that you do as an actor. Could you speak a little more on that and maybe give an example of a time when that knowledge helped you better understand a character that you were playing? Sure. Um, I mean, I think on the one hand, obviously one of the biggest challenges in our business is our own mental health, right? And so any curiosity about trying to understand that and trying to help ourselves and the people that we're around, I think is very helpful. And then in terms of character development, um, I think 
even just caring about why people act the way they do can bring such a great richness. Um, I talk a lot about how Christine in Phantom of the Opera is so iconic. We all kind of have an idea in our heads about who she is. And sometimes that idea is that she's this very sort of ethereal soprano who kind of is a little bit passive and somehow believes all these things. And um, I found when I joined the show, you know, I was given time to rehearse, but, and also to find my own, not my own take on it per se, but, but really just to find my own way into the character. And for me, it was very much about how Christine, what Christine's background is. You know, she is a person of Swedish descent, which means for her that ghosts are a very present part of her life. Her, she grew up with her father telling ghost stories. So she is willing to believe that there is this voice in her dressing room who actually belongs to her father. And then I think at the root of Christine's entire story is that she's dealing with this tremendous, tremendous loss that her father, her best friend is gone and she's just trying to cope, you know, and that really opens her up to somebody like the Phantom who will then take advantage of that um, and also drives all of the decision processes that she has throughout the whole show. Um, how, you know, she is a woman of her time, what her personal restrictions are. Um, and I think within that, it just allowed me to be able to make choices um, and really feel that I could make her into a real human being who, even though she's in a heightened musical, um, has genuine wants and needs and a history there. That's so cool. And some of that I did not know. Um, so you graduate from Yale and then you start auditioning and you get a job working for Disney, originally in California and then Tokyo. <laughs> um, so did you speak any Japanese and what was it like to make the decision to move to Tokyo and live and work there? Oh goodness, I did not, I tried to learn a little bit before of Japanese before I got to Japan. Um, and I'm embarrassed to say that I do not speak nearly as much Japanese as I should, considering that I lived there for about eight months um, and then have been back. I was back on a tour of West Side Story and I actually was just back in January doing a concert there. Um, but the, um, the Japanese fans are very kind and very generous about you know the few polite phrases that I do speak. And I found that in general, um, everybody was so um, gracious and kind when it came to communication. So that made um, that cultural barrier um, much easier. Um, and I, you know, I, my mom grew up in the Philippines, but we had never been there at that point. And I really wanted to get to go to Asia. And I thought a job opportunity that was going to allow me to work, but also have time to travel would be so exciting. And um, I absolutely love my time there. We had two days off a week. So I got to do a good amount of travel all over the country and just, you know, explore on my own, you know, take my bicycle around. We lived in the suburbs and, um, and kind of find, find new experiences. It was a really great growing experience for me. Um, and I love, now, you know, traveling as much as I can and really trying to get to know different cultures and, and, you know, as we were saying about knowing people who do different things, I think knowing people who come from different places and have different cultural backgrounds and um, different ways of living is also incredibly enriching um, in my work as an actor. So then how did you transition from that job to the national tour of Les Mis? So when I was a senior in high school, high school, when I was a senior in college, um, I performed in a graduate opera program production of The Marriage of Figaro. They had a small part in it that they didn't want to use one of their actual graduate students in because it wasn't featured enough. And so I auditioned, I played the role of Barbarina. And um, while we were performing, one of my cast members had his friend come to see the show. And afterwards she said, you know, that, that girl who played Barbarina sounds like she could sing musical theater as well. And he said, that's interesting because that's actually what she's interested in. And she happened to be a New York agent. And so she had me come in and audition for the agency and they took me on as a freelance uh, performer um, client. And so I went on some auditions with them. They were the ones who helped me book the Disney contracts. Um, but then I was gone for a while. I was 
out of the country. Um, and when I came back, uh, there had been some turnover in the agency. The head of the office had actually passed away. And, um, and so, and my contact had moved on. And so I emailed kind of, you know, whoever I could find at the agency saying, I'm back. Are you still interested in working with me? I would love to work with you. And thankfully somebody remembered me and said, yes. And actually we have an audition um, for the national tour of Les Mis. And I grew up completely obsessed with Les Mis. That was probably one of the first musicals that I memorized from beginning to end. Um, there's some very embarrassing footage of me at a very young age acting out the entire chain gang scene. I played both Valjean and Javert simultaneously, the whole thing. So of course I jumped at the chance to get to audition. Um, and I remember I went in, I sang the Cosette material fairly briefly. I think it went pretty well. And then I didn't hear anything for months. And I ended up, um, I had a job doing some summer stock. I actually played my first Maria in West Side Story in a small theater up in New Hampshire. And um, right before I went to New Hampshire, I booked um, a mini tour directed by Bayer Lee of The King and I playing Tupton. And I was thrilled, um, super excited. And then I went to New Hampshire. Um, I got a call from my agent saying, Les Mis is calling and they're wondering if you are available to do the tour because basically I had auditioned. They put my name in a file and said, you know, if this role is available someday, um, we'll consider her. And, um, and they ended up offering me a job in the ensemble um, understudying Cosette. And because I had this King and I job, I was really hesitant to take the, the Les Mis one instead. And I remember going back and forth with my agents about it. And they said, no, no, this is, this is Les Mis. You need to do Les Mis. This is a big deal. This is a great foot in the door for the industry. And I said, but it's the King and I, and I love the King and I, and I'd be playing a role. And in Les Mis, I'd be in the ensemble. And they're like, no, no. <laughs> like, we respect your opinion, Allie, but you are wrong. <laughs> please, please follow our advice. And um, I mean, I'm really grateful that I did. Obviously, who knows, you know, what path I would have gone on had I, um, had I taken the, the King and I job instead. And thankfully, many years later, almost exactly the same tour um, came back around and I got to play Top Tim with Bayork directing and that was wonderful. Um, but so I accepted the Les Mis job. Um, I flew out to Toronto. That's where I had my rehearsals. Um, a couple weeks after I joined, they hired another uh, Cosette understudy because somebody else was leaving and that was Sierra Vargas. So we got to understudy Cosette together on tour. Um, and I absolutely loved it. I mean, you know, the, the show is so much fun. It's strange to say that about such a dark, um, moving and important show, but particularly being in the ensemble was a blast. I was a, um, a young boy on the barricade. We called them bullet boys. And so I had a unibrow and dirt all over my face and blacked out teeth. And I'd run around hand, handing out bullets and my friend Joan and I, who was also playing a boy, would pick fights with the gang members. And it was so outside of my normal, you know, ingenuity life that, um, that it was so much fun. And so I did that um, for, goodness, maybe like eight months or so. And then somewhere around there, they sat us all down and said, okay, so we are closing this tour. This was the third national tour. So it would come kind of from the original, original Broadway production. Um, we're closing this tour, but we are opening a revival on Broadway and you are all welcome to audition for it if you are interested, <laughs> which as you can imagine, was a very challenging thing um, for all of us to take in, particularly my cast members who had been out on tour for say five, 10 years um, to be told that their job was going away. And if they wanted the same job in a different location, they would have to audition all over again. Um, and so that was kind of a stressful time. We, um, they allowed us to fly to New York in between tour stops. So between uh, Cleveland and Cincinnati, we came to New York, we all auditioned on the same day, then we flew to Cincinnati. Um, and I was fortunate to get a call back. So I had to leave Cincinnati, come back to New York, um, trying to keep that kind of on the down low because that hadn't happened for anybody else in the company. And that was awkward, understandably so. Um, and then I ended up booking the, uh, the Broadway company of Les Mis as Cosette. Um, and then my Cosette that I was understudying on tour ended up leaving for a different job. And so I took over for Cosette for the end of 
that tour. So I closed out the third national in the role. What was it like to, I mean, I, now I know that you were playing a bullet boy for a while and that was something <laughs> different for you. Um, but what was it like to live in that role for kind of a long time um, and then go through kind of two iterations of the same production? It was really interesting. It was, it was great, I think, because it was my Broadway debut and I was definitely intimidated by my cast, our cast was so incredible yeah. and there were yeah, people- Our cast. <laughs> right? Sometimes I mean, look back and I'm like, what? Like, you know, I grew up listening to Daphne Ruben Vega on the Rent album. I was a huge fan of Norm Lewis's. All of these people, I'd seen Celia and Spelling Bee. Um, and I think it was, it was really fortunate for me that I knew Adam, because Adam Jacobs and I, um, had been on tour together. He was my Marius on tour for a while. And so it was great that he and I already had a rapport. And so I felt safe there. And I felt like I did have something to bring to the table um, because I knew the part already. Um, but it was great to have our rehearsal process. John Caird was so great about letting us improvise, have some improv sessions, and really be collaborative about restaging the show. I think that that um, brought a whole extra layer. It's one thing to replace in a show that's already running, but to really get to start and start from scratch, kind of, um, and to get to put our own spins on the characters and the blocking um, was really exciting. But it was also, I mean, the problem with Cosette, I think, is that she, um, because the role is shared between the child version of Cosette and the adult version of Cosette, the adult version of Cosette really doesn't have a huge amount of time on stage. And instead, while everybody else is playing on the barricade, um, she's sitting alone in her dressing room, stressing out about having to float a high C while sitting down after not having sung for like half an hour. Um, so it was actually really, it was really good, I think, that I got to be on tour and kind of observe what the trap of that part was. And then to really try and prepare myself for the mental challenge of playing a role like that, where um, there is a lot of pressure put on um, some very challenging vocal stuff and not necessarily as much um, much redemption because the, because of the um, the arc of the character for the adults is very is very quick and to deal with sort of the solitude and the FOMO of just being in your dressing room while everybody else is playing um, and so that was part of why I left the Les Mis revival after a year um, because I knew that I had already done it for some time and I just wanted to make sure that I was in the headspace where I loved my job and, um, and I valued what I was doing and I was a good cast mate and team member. And, um, and so I think it was a good decision for me to leave while I was feeling good about all of it and not kind of oversee my welcome. And then you've done very intensive roles since then that you've also stayed for a good amount of time, such as Christine in Phantom and Maria on tour, um, how do you save yourself from chronic fatigue? And how long did it take you to develop a self-care routine that really worked for you for a long period of time like that? It's a great question. Um, I think I'm still constantly reevaluating sort of the best way to take care of myself. Um, West Side was the first real challenge that way in playing Maria on tour, which meant that oftentimes, you know, our one day off was the day that we were traveling. Um, and that's a huge thing and also just such an emotional journey. Um, I often talk about how, you know, we, we act out all these emotions on stage and I personally don't really put a lot of my own history into the characters. I find that if I'm truly immersed in the story and playing the character, I can cry, I can go through all those, um, go through all those emotions without it being me. However, my body thinks that I'm definitely going through trauma every night and it's exhausting. It's really, it's really challenging. Um, I found, particularly when I was doing Phantom, that, you know, I tried to rest a lot. It's all about, you know, water and yoga and all the things that sounds sort of boring um, sleep, so much sleep. Um, 
and getting acupuncture, getting massages, really doing anything that kind of revitalized my body and um, making sure that I rested on my days off. I'm a person who, if I can, I'd love to be doing three projects simultaneously, doing all of the concerts, doing all the readings during the day. Um, but it's it's been a process engaging what I can do because I want to be able to um, be my best on stage and to prevent myself from getting sick or getting very, very sick. Um, and so it's definitely um, a work in progress always. Um, and um, something that I do try to value in, in really taking care of myself and calling out when I need to. You know, I think that's that's a lesson that's hard to learn and took me a long time to learn um, that the show does go on. That's what understudies are for. Having been an understudy, you know, we love the opportunity to go on and understudies are incredibly talented and do an amazing job on the show. So um, it's much better to take care of oneself and the health of the show than to kind of push beyond my boundaries. You were the first Asian American actress to play Christine on Broadway. Um, and on your social media, you're a very vocal supporter of representation. What did that experience mean to you, both just to you, Ali, as an actress, and then also as a Filipina actress, increasing representation in a role that hasn't always seen the most diversity in the actresses playing it? It was really such a gift. I mean, it's interesting because I would wanted to play Christine in Phantom of the Opera since, you know, I don't know, 10 years old at least. And I had been auditioning for that role probably for about 10 years. I think my first audition for it was while I was on the Les Mis tour. Um, I auditioned for the Vegas company. And so by the time that I actually booked the job, what was great about it was that I had already let it go so many times that I was able to really just be grateful for the opportunity to get to play the part. And then on top of that, to be given this honor of being the first Asian American Christine, really the first Christine of color to play the part on Broadway, um, I thought of as such, a, um, such an honor, but also a responsibility. I wanted to very much make sure that I did a great job and honored the story and the character and so that I would not be the last by a long shot. And, um, and so that really inspired me to continue to, you know, to do the show to the best of my ability. Um, and, you know, I, speaking of Les Mis, my big watershed moment that I remember very clearly was seeing Leia Salonga, who we got to do Les Mis with on Broadway, play Eponine in Les Mis when I was a child. I got to see her and um, and I'd also seen her in Miss Saigon, but seeing a Filipina actress playing a non-traditional role, and she was amazing. She is amazing. Um, and, you know, and to great acclaim as Eponine, um, really opened my eyes to the possibilities of what I could be capable of. And I think that's the thing about representation is when you see people that you can relate to, you start to dream bigger. Um, and to believe that that you have opportunities. Um, and I was really, really fortunate to get to be that person um, for, for others as well. And that people were very kind about expressing that to me at the stage door, online, on social media and all that stuff. Um, it was really, it was really fulfilling in a way that um, was surprising in that, you know, I wanted the part for selfish reasons, right? <laughs> but then, um, but then it, to get to have a greater impact um, has been has been really fulfilling. And the Asian American Broadway community is awesome. We are so wonderfully supportive of each other. And I love being part of that community. I love being part of the Broadway community. Um, and so really kind of all the love flowing back and forth um, was a really, really special thing to add to getting to play a special part. Well, I had the privilege of seeing you and you were fantastic. Did you have a favorite moment in that show kind of consistently that um, night after night you were able to take in just for you? I think my favorite part, mm, it was a combination of things, but definitely the boat ride. There's something about that title song and you're on this boat and it's so iconic. I mean, that is the thing that I remember as a child. And what's wonderful about Phantom is that so little has actually changed in the 30 years, 32 years now that it's been on Broadway. 
And in a lot of ways, that's really preserved the magic of it. So to get to be on this boat with the phantom behind me, this iconic song singing um, in, you know, in the, the white flowy dress and to watch like the, the fog on the stage with these candelabras magically shimmering and coming up. There's, it's really cool. And then every now and then you get a glimpse of yourself in the mirror and say, oh, look, it's Christine. Oh, Christine is, Christine is me. <laughs> It was like a really, I don't know. I mean, you would think that it would get old, but honestly, it's such, it's, it's part of why I love theater so much is that there's this magic that continues to exist and exists for the people who get to, to play with it too. That's part of where the joy comes from, I think, is experiencing something over and over again, but finding new joy in it each time. So we like to wrap up with a kind of fun, funny question. Um, which is that in all of your years now of performing and doing various iconic roles, do you have a favorite or funny on stage mishap? <laughs> oh gosh, I have so many. Um, what? Which? It'd which be more story? than one, if you have good ones. <laughs> <laughs> well, the um, the first lame is one that comes to mind. Um, is um, I had a little bit of a wardrobe malfunction in Cosette's reappearance in the second act, um, where some for some reason, you know, it's the scene with Beljan and Marius and Cosette. And I my skirt just unhooked itself somehow. And thankfully I felt it go, but I had to hold it up in the front because otherwise the whole thing would fall down. And but I also had to hug. Valjean, I had to pick up a tray, I had to do all of this business all while singing and somehow I kind of managed to sort of maneuver the thing and was like switching hands and I got off stage and I said to Adam Jacobs, it was like, oh my gosh, wasn't that crazy with my skirt falling off? He's like, huh? What? I didn't notice that. So I was very proud of myself that I had kind of pulled it off without looking completely panicky, but it felt totally crazy. Um, probably the most embarrassing blooper story that I have was when I was doing The King and I on Broadway, the revival, and we were gearing up for Tony season, which meant that the audience was filled with fancy people, I mean, Broadway fancy people, but you know, people that I was um, very honored to perform for and very nervous about. And we were in the second act. I was wearing um, my um, Western wives kind of skirt. And because of what had happened at the very beginning of the second act, I had very little underdressed under this hoop skirt. And I also had fallen down um, in a choreographed way, like twice at that point. And people were always picking me up and it was supposed to be funny. And so we're doing the scene, um, Kelly O'Hara, Ken Watanabe are talking in front. We, the wives, were standing behind. We're supposed to do the whole thing where we, um, we bend down to bow and the king looks and is like, ah! Or Anna, um, Anna's like, oh, they're not wearing undergarments. And that's the whole joke. We did all of that stuff. But because of that, we had um, sort of trick skirts that had these elastics in between our legs so that the skirts would deploy over our heads with our butts facing upstage so the audience couldn't see, but that Anna could see. And so later in the scene, we're still standing there and we all have to back up and I back up and somehow the back of my hoop skirt sticks to the stage and I keep backing up and the skirt is still there. And so slowly the whole skirt starts to tip upwards. And one of my castmates who said it, who was, or who watched it said that it was, like watching a doll just kind of slowly tip over and then fall down. And so I fell slowly onto my butt. My hoop skirt deployed completely over my head. So mind you, very little undergarments and like a elastic in between my legs. The audience laughs because it looks like a Pratt fall. <laughs> and I fall down before. <laughs> Ken Watanabe, sweet man, runs over. The, the whole, all of my castmates on stage were like, Woo! he comes to help me stand up. And in an attempt to cover with some sort of ad lib, speaking of, you know, speaking another language, fluent in Japanese, really um, had worked so hard on his English, but was not quite fluent yet. Um, and in, in desperation to cover the moment said, uh, are you okay? in character as the king, which of course then <laughs> gave away to the entire audience. 
<laughs> that I had not meant to fall on my butt. Um, but what was great was afterwards, um, uh, Allison uh, Mitchell and Brian Stokes Mitchell were there and um, and I was talking to them afterwards and apparently they had had a whole conversation between the two of them about whether or not I had fallen on purpose and Stokes believed that I had. So I will take that. <laughs> thing was choreographed but um but yeah the, the audience got a little more than they paid for <laughs> that show for sure <laughs> well Allie this has been such a treat and thank you so much for being a member of our face-to-face -face series oh thank you it was my pleasure always wonderful to see you and thank you for including me Thank you for joining us on Face to Face. We would like to thank our sponsors, Oak Tree Development and the Community Foundation for Greater New Haven and Brad Ross for the themed music. You can follow us on LegacyTheaterCT.org.